personalized medicine, otherwise called precision medicine, is an approach where treatments are directed towards individual patients. So one might ask, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Uh, personalized medicine is, you know, I come to a physician and he's supposed to give a medicine or recommend a treatment for me, for my preferences and for my uh, medical problems in mind. Yes, that is what the physicians are supposed to be doing and they are doing it now, but as a physician I can tell that my knowledge base is based on what's called control studies. What these control studies are, they're not based on individual studies, but they're based on population studies. In other words, the studies are done on uh, large populations and the results are to be extrapolated and applied to an individual. In other words, it's a population-based study but the physician has to cater that treatment to an individual. So let me give you an example uh, to clarify this. I work as a hospital physician and I see a lot of critical care patients, patients who are admitted to the hospitals for uh, a lot of medical problems to surgical problems. Medical problems could be pneumonias and bronchitis or uh, septicemia and other type of uh, serious infections. And they may also undergo a surgery where they're in pain. So one of the common drugs that are given for, for instance, cough is called codeine. Codeine is a fantastic drug given for coughing, cough, uh, that is usually accompanied. Um, uh, it was one of the main symptoms for pneumonias and bronchitis and upper respiratory infections. So when I prescribe codeine to a patient, as a physician, I hope, I'm not sure, but I hope that, that this drug will suppress the cough and relieve the patient of the distress. But what really happens when the drug goes into the body of the patient, when, when the drug is taken by the patient, is a whole different story. So I commonly see that patient, you know, when I go back to the patient and ask how the codeine is working, I realize that there's a lot of individual variation on how the patient responded to the codeine, okay. Um, what it translates to is, the patient might say, yes, doc, codeine worked great. You know, I, my cough is better. It's he helping me cough. It lasts for three to four hours. This is the ideal patient that I would like to see. But that's not what happens in real life. Um, patient might say, you know, it, it barely touched my cough. It didn't really help anything. So what I do is I go up on the dose. Um, most of the drugs in medicine, especially the cancer drugs and uh, HIV drugs, there's what's called a maximum tolerated dose. So we keep going up and up and up on the dosage of the level, hoping that at a certain level uh, it'll help the individual treat an illness or, or uh, help with the symptom. Um, and if it doesn't help at the maximum tolerated dose, which is the dose where you see the desired effect, but not the side effects. Okay, so if the drug doesn't help uh, either relieve the symptom or treat the illness, then I switch to a different type of drug or different class of drug. So this is the usual practice in medicine. But what happens really when the codeine goes into the body, when the patient swallows the pill or takes the liquid form of codeine? So when codeine goes into the body, it has to be broken down into an active compound. Codeine is an inactive substance, so it goes into the body, it has to be broken down or activated into an active compound. So that active compound called morphine is the one that does the magic. It's the one that uh, helps relieve the pain, um, relieve the cough. But the enzyme that converts codeine to morphine, morphine is the active comp uh, component, 
back to compound of morphine. There is a lot of individual variation in this enzyme. So if for instance, if the person that I'm giving codeine does not have a fully functioning enzyme, so he will not be able to convert this codeine into the active compound. So this the drug doesn't really work for him. And on the other end of the spectrum, there can be an individual wherein the enzyme that converts the codeine into its active compound can act ultra fast. So he'll get instant relief. So you see on one end of the spectrum, you don't see any effect of codeine because that individual lacks that enzyme, um, technically called non-metabolizer, um, and so you don't see the effect of the drug. And the other end of the spectrum where you see immediate effect, but the effect doesn't last long. So what this translates to when I round on these patients is, the patient who does not have the active comp enzyme might say, doc, the drug does nothing to me. You know, I need something else. Then if I'm not knowledgeable of this particular reaction that goes within the human body, which a lot of physicians are not, because pharmacology is an extensive field of uh, science where, and, 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 the, and the knowledge base is expanding exponentially as we discover more drugs, more interactions with other drugs. Um, the, the field is expanding exponentially, and a lot of physicians do not have this depth of knowledge for all the drugs they're prescribing, including me. Um, so what I do is I hope by giving this drug, I hope sometimes the patient also hopes and they even pray that this drug or the treatment I'm giving works. Why we rely on hope and prayer and this and that when we give treatment is because of the very reason I said earlier, because most of the drugs and treatments are based on population studies, and they're not individual studies. So this is what we practice now, popul based on population statistics, and not, in its truest sense, personalized medicine. But if we ask, why did we practice population studies, population statistics, why do we base our uh, treatments and recommendations, the physician's treatments and recommendations and population studies, we have to go back and examine uh, how we arrived at, at the current, what we call disease-centric approach or organ-centric approach. In other words, there is a problem in the dis problem in the organ, you go in and find out where the problem is and you treat the organ or the organ system, like respiratory system, which includes lung and, and other uh, trachea, bronchi, respiratory tract and other, that's an organ system. So you go in and tackle the organ system. That is how we arrived at what we call specialists. That is our current practice of medicine. But if you look at history of medicine, we see that personalized medicine, in its truest sense, was actually practiced for centuries before we stumbled upon this organ uh, or disease-centric approach. The way we practice personalized medicine in the ancient past was true to its meaning. The village healer or the healer of the tribe would actually go to the patient's house and examine the individual, not just the individual, but he would examine the individual in relationship to his environment. So not only he is examining the individual, examining the patient, he's examining the surroundings in which he, he's living. He's also asking other questions like lifestyle questions, his diet, and, and uh, sometimes he, he is even looking at his reading his palm, uh, he's looking at his uh, horoscope, for instance, uh, he's talking to his family members, he's, he's even taking his dream analysis. Uh, he, he's doing a lot of, in other words, he's taking a lot of variables into consideration. And when he's done with his analysis, uh, he would go back to his home or the clinic and he would um, prepare medicine, the concoction, with just this patient in mind. So he would go grab 
uh, herbs and mix it up and add some chemicals to it, prepare a concoction by that evening usually. And the patient would come and pick it up and the, and the physician would say, use this, this is what I prepared for you in mind, specifically you in mind, and do not give it to anybody else, even if they had similar symptoms or similar health problems. This was personalized medicine to its core, practiced in the ancient past. And when we look at what's happening now, we see population statistics, not personalized medicine. The, the one wonders why, why we moved from such a personalized medicine to what we're practicing now, which is again based on hope and prayer and so on and so forth. There was a huge limitation for practicing the personalized medicine the way they practiced it in the ancient past. See, when we try to understand as complex as a human being um, what's going on in, the, in our insides and how um, we succumb to illnesses and, and what really happens when we are stuck with the disease, it's an extremely complex mechanism that, that happens inside our body. To understand this, just like when we try to understand nature or astronomy, we use models. Phys physicists, for instance, use what's called classical mechanics um, after Newton. And then we have quantum mechanics. So these are the models that we use, the theories that we use to understand um, aspects of nature, aspects of um, the stars and astronomy. And similarly, we use certain models to understand human operating system. So the model that our ancient healers uh, used was what we call holistic approach. By holistic, it means that there is the matter, there is the human flesh and bone that we are healing. And then there was this notion that there is a spirit or a soul that is responsible for the functioning of all these body parts. So they had to heal the body, the flesh and bone, the matter, and they also had to heal the soul or the spirit. So we had the healer of the soul and the healer of the body. So these two was one person. Plato, for instance, roughly about, he lived about 2,400 years or so ago. He had this notion that in treating diseases, the physician ought to be the healer of the body, and he's also the healer of the spirit. And he worried that at some point in future, we would separate these two. And he cautioned the healers not to do this, because only by treating the soul or the spirit and the body together, you are actually doing justice to the patient, to the individual. This was holistic medicine. This was personalized medicine to its core. So this went on for several centuries. So the village shaman or the healer or the of the tribe would come out uh, to the patient's house and diagnose whatever method he uses. and. Um, he would, he would use herbs and oils and whatever he had uh, at his disposal. And then he would also go back and what they call complete the spirit. He would use rituals and incantations and um, prayers and s sacrifices even to heal the spirit. Um, so he would, he would treat both together. And this went on for a while. And roughly about 600 years before Christ, 600 BC, there arose um, a period in Greek medicine where reason started to dominate the practice. One of the individuals was Pythagoras. Pythagoras was a polymath. He was a philosopher, he was a mathematician, he was an astronomer, he was a politician. Uh, he was a priest. So he was all in one person. So he came up with this idea that this, the individual is a microcosm, which is a reflection of the macrocosm, what's out there in nature. So he would use the
the principles, the models he studied in nature and applied it to human beings. He would use what's called the principle of opposites. So he came up with this idea or theory or hypothesis, what we call now, that by balancing opposites, you can treat illnesses. So his hypothesis or theory was called humoral theory. He was one of the main patriarchs, the proponents of the what we call humoral theory. Humoral theory is simply balancing the different fluids within the body. Pythagoras felt that the human body contained a mixture of four humors. In this context, humor means fluids. The four fluids are black bile, yellow or red bile, uh, blood and phlegm. So these are the different fluids. Uh, these are the technical names that they actually gave, but it was not in English at the time. Blood was the life-giving fluid and it became the most significant of the four humors because it provided nourishment to the body. When disordered, however, when there is an imbalance of blood, it caused inflammation and fever. And this is why the term blood poisoning for septicemia is still in use. So each individual possessed a particular humoral makeup. Now here he is personalizing this humoral makeup to individuals. And an imbalance of these were believed to result in deposition of noxious substances or toxic substances leading to disease and even death. So medical practitioners therefore used therapeutic techniques that imitated the body's natural healing mechanisms to um, balance these humors. So the treatments uh, consists of assisted expulsion of these toxins uh, through the usual excretory organs for instance, uh, enemas and cathartics to increase bowel movements, uh, expectorants to induce coughing, and diuretics to induce urination. And uh, the most relied upon technique was bloodletting. This included cutting open the veins in selected parts of the body to bleed the patient of excess blood. These treatments purged the patient of these excess uh, humors or fluids in the body, and so the individual is brought back to the equilibrium or balance of these fluids and so that is how the diseases were uh, treated at that time. This as unscientific as it sounds was the popular theory and, and it made a lot of sense to the patient because they knew that what the patient was doing and when the what the physician was doing and the, when the physician explained that this is what we're going to do because you you have excess of blood it made absolute sense to the patient and they completely accepted this as the most uh, effective treatment for a lot of diseases this is treating the matter which is the flesh and uh, bones and the uh, and the blood and, and the body part body. And then we have treating the spirit. That is the second aspect of, of uh, the treatment. So these physicians or the healers, being priests also, would use uh, prayers and rituals and ceremonies and sacrifices uh, to heal the spirit or to complete the spirit. And together it made total sense to the patients and the physicians. And this went on for almost 23 centuries. Uh, nobody questioned it because this was backed by Pythagoras and then came Hippocrates. He also supported this, this theory, but Hippocrates came a few hundred years after Pythagoras. He tried to introduce reason into medicine. He was the person who said, it is not the disease that matters, it is the person or the individual with the disease that you the physician ought to treat. Although this concept or this notion is nothing new now and it is, uh, it doesn't sound uh, revolutionary, but it was revolutionary at that time. He genuinely tried to separate the priest from the physician so that uh, the physician, the healer is practicing within reason and not based on um, spiritual practices. But then came, about 400 years after Hippocrates, an individual who would change the fate of medicine. Um, 
for almost 2000 years. His name was Galen. Galen was an individual. He was charismatic. Um, he, he attained celebrity status. Galen expanded the humoral theory, added several other elements to it, added several other philosophical theories to it. And his influence was so strong, so even hundreds of years later, uh, Galen's teaching prevailed as last word in medicine, so much so that Galen's words became the language of medicine. As late as 1600s, to earn a diploma of doctor of medicine, students were required to recite an oath that included this line, fellows must never speak disrespectfully of Galen. Galen's theories became the foundation of authority of all medical writers and physicians, resulting in the establishment of a medical orthodoxy that went undisputed. Questioning Galen was tantamount to doubting the wisdom of the Greek lineage all the way to Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras and Hippocrates. Physicians just didn't learn from Galen. They worshipped his teachings as infallible notions with unshakable trust. Medicine as science could not progress until the field of science disregarded Galen's theories, but no one dared to question Galen. The reason why this was is for centuries, humanities included not only arts and politics and language, it also included science. So now we see science and humanities as two different uh, paths uh, to our profession. But in the ancient, not just in the ancient past, even up until 17th or 18th centuries, humanities included science. And a physician had to graduate in humanities to become the person of science and become a physician. So he had to study philosophy, he had to study art, and he was a polymath for centuries. And part of the training was training in philosophy. And medicine and spirituality went hand in hand. When Christianity in the Western Hemisphere and the Western part of the world rose to dominance, the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox Christianity came to dominate the field of medicine because it took some of the philosophies of the Greek, in fact, some of the Aristotelian philosophies trickled into the teachings of Christianity. And so those philosophies became part of the physician's training. And so a physician was continued to be a philosopher and a priest. But what happened was, even in 1600s, even up to 1700s, we did not know what was causing fevers. We blamed it on air. We, we blamed it on angering gods, deception. Diseases were a result of deception, disloyalty, theft, angering gods, and so on. And we called the reason for fever, we called it bad air, what we now call malaria, mal air. Mal air is bad air. That is why what we attributed fevers to. So medicine could not progress any further, any further because of this spiritual element. Biologists and physicians and healers could not cut and probe human body because it was human body was seen as a temple of spirit. And so they could not probe or cut or experiment upon, upon the human body. So then came two influential personalities who would forever shake the foundation of this practice of medicine. It was Francis Bacon and, and Rene Descartes the philosophers who would forever change the fate of medicine and science in general. Francis Bacon touched medicine at several points, predominantly regarding the introduction of methods to study human physiology. It was primarily because of Bacon that the 16th century became the bedrock of experimental 
studies. Uh, he started a revolution in understanding the natural world by changing the face of exploration through his fearless approach. He became convinced that the only types of theories worth considering were the ones that could be put to test. The crux of his idea lied in the basic logic that the accumulation of facts by mere observation, which had been the method used for centuries prior, was not sufficient to study nature. In modern times, we take this understanding entirely for granted, but this was a radical notion then. Although this idea may be touched upon in ancient and medieval periods, Bacon was the first to formalize the method for investigating nature. So up until that time, we had a lot of theories about how the human operating system worked, but what we lacked was a method to test those theories. Francis Bacon was first among who revolutionized this approach. And this was supported by Rene Descartes, who felt that nature and human body was like a clock-like mechanism. So between these two, giants who were also philosophers, they devised or they at least helped come up with this idea of testing our theories. So when we have a hypothesis, we lacked a method to test those hypotheses. It was the first time in our human history there was a push towards testing what we proposed. This became the foundation of scientific method. By this time, physicists and chemists and mathematicians started gathering into scientific societies and used the scientific method to prove or disprove their theories. But physicians were lacking, or physicians were hesitant to join these scientific communities even at that time. The, the notion was that human body was too complex to subject to experimentation and testing and analysis and therefore uh, medicine was still regarded as an art um, and physicians and the healers refused to join scientific communities and treat this medicine as a branch of science. But with the push of Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes and some of the healers and the practitioners, physicians quickly realized that without experimentation, their understanding of human biology would be severely limited. So they started agreeing to experiment on human body. But there was a limitation experimenting on human biology, which was not there while experimenting in by physicists or chemists or mathematicians. Physicists, math, and chemists can experiment in laboratories, in controlled environments, but human biology is too complex. If you look at how human biology functions, it's what we call multidirectional, which means several variables act at once. But scientific experiments are done in a linear fashion. You have to, what we call, control all these variables so that you can study one equation or one function at a time. Human mind cannot grasp more than two or three variables at a time. And if that had to be done, we needed another assistance. We need another method to test human biology and human functioning and physiology in the laboratories. Mathematicians came to the aid of the physicians using calculus and statistics. So between calculus and statistics, doctors were able to test what was once untestable. So they were able to factor in more than one or two variables at a time and conduct their experiments, but they were done on, in controlled environments again. So that was a huge compromise that they had to make. 
so that they can understand human biology better than our ancestors. So this was the time when the major disruption in medicine happened. I would say this was the only disruption that happened to medicine, shifting from art to science, what we call controlled experiments. Art involves getting as much information, taking into as many variables as possible into consideration, and coming up with a treatment plan based on intuition, based on reason, based on feeling, based on emotion. And that is the art of medicine. That was the type of medicine that was practiced for centuries. But when controlled experiments came out, that is no longer possible. Everything had to be measured. Every, there, there had to be proof for every hypothesis. Either you prove or disprove the hypothesis. So there is no role for intuition, insight, revelation, feelings or emotions. Galileo famously said, measure what can be measured and make measurable what cannot be measured. So for instance, we see this in medicine when we are assessing pain in a patient, in an individual. See, pain is a subjective experience. How do you quantify this? You cannot really put a number to pain because it is a number nine out of 10 would be different for each patient. So there is a subjective variability when it comes to pain, but then we made that which cannot be measured, measurable, by giving it a scale. For instance, a scale of 10 out of 10 pain is what puts you in, in the emergency department. It's excruciating pain, the worst pain of your life. And then you go down the level to a level where the pain is zero. So you get this scale of pain level, and you, may, you use these levels in your experimentation so that you have quantifiable, measurable data that can be experimented upon using statistics and calculus and come up with outcomes and results. And those statistical studies based on population studies will be applied to the individuals. That is how we arrived at population based studies. And that is what using population studies not based on personalized studies because that was not feasible to experiment on one individual. So we had to consider population studies. What we call randomized control studies became the gold standard, therefore. Um, every drug, every treatment has to, has to go through the grind of these population studies, controlled experiments, randomized control studies, and used, up, used in, the, in the clinician's office or the hospitals. Now, these population studies are an impoverished version of what's actually happening within the human body. It's a very crude approximation of the reality because it is a population study and not an individual study. So now we are moving towards what we call genomics and proteomics study, which we hope is going to take us into the path of personalized medicine. Now, genomic and proteomic studies are based on individual genetic and protein analysis. Genome is the entire set of DNA within an organism. If you look at the DNA base pairs, there are six billion DNA base pairs. And only 0.3% of variation of all these 6 billion base pairs account for the individual variation. So it seems like a small number, but it is considering 6 billion base pairs and 0.3% of it is still a huge number. Our hope is that we will be able to come up with an approach to cater to individual needs based on genetic makeup and based on the protein structure and function. 
But again, this also comes with a huge limitation that we ought to be careful about because we now learn that even our genome and protein, let me explain you what genome and protein is. See, the DNA, information passes from DNA to an RNA to manufacture proteins in the body. Proteins make up the skeletal and the muscular and every structure in our body. So if we understand how our proteins are manufactured, we can tweak in, we can um, change the structure and function and play with it and come up with the desired traits and qualities of the, of, for the individual. So but what, we, what we lately realized is that even these genes and proteins are in dynamic equilibrium with the environment. In other words, they're constantly changing with the environment, with the person's even mood, the diet he takes, the stress levels, the environment he lives in. So if we study genome, if we do a genome analysis at a point in time, a few years later or a few months, even a few months later, it might have changed. So then we have to redo the genomic analysis. So that is the limitation we will be facing in future, even in this type of personalized medicine. But we hope that we continue to improvise and improve upon ourselves and come up with personalized um, treatment plan. This is personalized medicine at its best. When biometrics and sensors collect real-time data and they are processed in real-time, and machine-to-machine -machine communication takes place, and artificial intelligence matures, the physician's role would be limited to helping the patient in making complex decisions, guiding to the treatments, and being there through the disease, entire disease process, not as a decision, sole decision maker, but helping the patient in guiding through the decision maker, being in the game, being the physicians being in the game of medicine, they would be able to better understand the language of medicine to help and guide the patient through this process while automation, artificial intelligence and machines take over most of the decision making. Not just the analysis of the data but also the decision making. So this is going to be the future of medicine and it is going to be a multidisciplinary approach where in the ancient past the healer was everybody. The physician knows the best um, model where the healer was not only the one who is examining, diagnosing, predicting um, the disease process, but he's also the pharmacist, he's the spiritual healer, he's the counselor, he's the guide, he's there for the patient through and through. But now we have the physician, we have spiritual counselor, we have a pharmacist, we have a biostatistician, we have a molecular biologist, we have <clears throat> pharmaceutical companies, policy maker, all these people involved in the care of this one individual who is the center um, of care. And so it's a, as a multidisciplinary team, the physician being the, still the team leader will be guiding the patient through um, the decision-making process. Mm -hmm.